Hello everyone. Good evening. I hope I'm audible and visible to all of you. If I'm audible and visible, quickly give me a confirmation in the uh, chat box so that I know that you're able to hear to me and listen to me. So if you're able to hear me and listen to me, kindly give me a quick confirmation. Okay, thank you Devashish and uh, today we are going to do a quick session for rapid uh, you know revision for those students who are appearing for the FMG examination. So this is going to be a very 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 quick session and uh, we are going to do uh, <coughs> a few questions. I think about 35 questions I have to be very precise. So we will discuss questions, we will discuss the answers, we will discuss the other options and we will discuss around that topic but uh, not into details but in brief but at any point of time if you feel there is a need for you to learn something more, you want to ask something more, you're always free to do so. So if you have any points in your mind that you think you're not able to understand, please don't hesitate, please do ask immediately. Okay, so before we start the class, let me just tell you what we have from an academy. We have this an academy goal where we get a flat 20% off on all the NEAT PG store subscriptions. You can use the target next batch or the target FMG batch. And uh, this is uh, from May 22nd to May 26th. Use the code in the ENT live and you get a 10% off. And uh, we have target FMG 2023 batch. Uh, <clears throat> so we have this high yield revision batch for the upcoming examination and uh, here we are going to have 200 hours of recorded content of important theory topics, 10 plus hours of live mentorship, uh, you know, and doubt solving session and we're going to have high yield MCQs, all of that and at a very, very reasonable price, which you can again get at a discounted one of ENT if you use ENT live. We have target next batch. So this is going to start live from 25th of May. Live classes are always very interactive, very, uh, you know, useful because you're going to study with the educator and your studies are going to complete simultaneously. There is no uh, thinking, there is no procrastination that I'll do it now, I'll do it now and you don't end up doing it. So these, these live sessions are definitely of, are going to be of utmost help for you if you're preparing for the exams. Great. So now let's begin with the discussion. Atrophic trinasal mucosa, extensive crusting with woody hard feel of the external nose. So they are asking you a question which is saying there is atrophic mucosa, there is extensive crusting and there is a woody hard feeling of the external nose. What is it suggestive to you of rhinosporidiosis, rhinoscleroma, atrophic rhinitis or carcinoma of the nose? So please answer in the chat box what do you think is the answer? Is it 1, 2, Three or four. Good evening, Prakhar. Hello, Alfie. So I'm waiting for your answers in the chat box. So basically, when we hear the word atrophic mucosa, when we talk about crusting, the first thing that goes in our head is atrophic rhinitis. But here they have told you one very important feature that is going to change your diagnosis from atrophic rhinitis to another condition. So when there is a woody heart feeling of the external nose, which we call it as hebra nose, you should know that this is a diagnosis of rhinoscleroma. Okay, so the answer is rhinoscleroma. In rhinoscleroma, there are three stages. The first stage is called as the atrophic stage where you have got atrophic mucosa and crusting. The second stage is called as granulomatous stage where you have got a granuloma which is woody heart feeling in consistency. And the third stage is called as stage of cicatrization where there is narrowing and stenosis of the nasal cavity. Okay, so these are the three stages. In the granulomatous stage, the name is called as Hebranos. In cicatrization stage, we call it as Tapirnos. In rhinosporidiosis, you get a vascular polyp, a red vascular polyp, and that is resembling a strawberry. So the name is strawberry-like mass. So whenever you get a strawberry-like mass in the nasal cavity, you must think about rhinosporidiosis. And rhinosporidiosis is caused by an aquatic protozoan, rhinosporidium seaberry. Atrophic rhinitis is a condition which is caused by a gram-negative bacillus, which is Klebsiella uh, oziana. And this condition can present to you with the same clinical findings of atrophic mucosa crusting in the nose. And carcinoma of the nose, of course, has got no of this clinical feature, so you can easily rule this out. So I think this was a pretty simple question, and I'm hoping that all of you know the answer to it. Okay, let's go to the next question. 
what is this structure there is a structure marked here what is this structure can you tell me what is the name of this structure is this a part of the larynx or is this a part of the hypopharynx if this is a part of your hypopharynx then which subdivision of your hypopharynx is it a part of your piriform fossa is it a part of your post cricoid region or is it a part of your posterior pharyngeal wall so what part is it i'm waiting for your answers yes i'm waiting for your answers what is this part <clears throat> yes so first of all let us understand some of the structures that you see here so basically what structures you see here is the first structure that you see here this is that of the epiglottis epiglottis is like a flap that opens and closes the laryngeal inlet thus protecting from any sort of aspiration now the projections that you see here posteriorly these are your arytenoid cartilages now from the epiglottis to the arytenoid you get these folds these folds are called as airy epiglottic folds so epiglottis anteriorly airy epiglottic fold laterally and arytenoids posteriorly together will form the upper part of your larynx now below your airy epiglottic folds what you see here these are your false cords below the false cords what you have is your true cords below the true cords you have the subglottis subglottis leads you to the trachea so all the structures that we studied so far are parts of your larynx okay all the structures epiglottis ae fold arytenoids interarytenoid bonds false cords true cords subglottis and trachea larynx leads to trachea but now if we see what are the structures on the side if you see these two depressions that you see on the side of this airy epiglottic fold these are called as your piriform fossa behind the interarytenoid fold you see there is another depression this is called as post cricoid region and behind here you see a wall this wall is called as your posterior pharyngeal wall so these are your three subdivisions of your hypopharynx so piriform fossa are paired structure post cricoid region and posterior pharyngeal wall are your unpaired structure so the structure that is marked to you is that of the piriform fossa so what structure you see is that of the piriform fossa so i hope everyone understood the parts of the larynx the endoscopic image of the larynx and the hypopharynx are able to understand and point out the structures as well so great now let's go to the next. there is basically some soft tissue lesion behind the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus that is pushing the posterior wall anteriorly it's pushing the posterior wall forwards what is this sign called as and where do you see this sign so what is this sign called as and where do you see this sign so i'm waiting in the chat box from all of you what do you call this sign okay so this sign is called as the hallman miller sign so the name of this sign is called as hallman miller sign so what is hallman miller sign anterior bowing of posterior wall of maxillary sinus so this sign is called as hallman miller sign and where do we see the sign we see this sign in patients with juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma so juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is a exclusive disease that you see in the juvenile age group it is a disease that occurs most commonly in the nasopharynx it is the most common benign tumor of the nasopharynx and angiofibroma meaning it is a tumor fibrous in nature but lot of blood vessels so it has got lot of angio or blood vessels so it's an extremely vascular condition this tumor is exclusively seen in males because this is supposed to be testosterone dependent for its growth now this tumor presents to you with three main symptoms the three main symptoms are bleeding which is recurrent unprovoked profuse epistaxis 
Along with that, they produce to you obstructive symptoms, which we call it as prog phase deformity and unilateral serous otitis media. And they can also present to you with cranial nerve palsies. Essentially, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth nerve palsies are the ones that get involved. So this is about JNA. Now, how do you diagnose JNA? A contrast enhanced CT scan is used for the diagnosis and the on CT scan, you see this sign which is called as Hallman Miller sign. Also, you see another sign which is called as the Hondusa sign, which is seen on the CT scan. Angiography is done to identify what is the feeding vessel to the tumor and what's the treatment? It is embolization followed by surgical excision. So everything about JNA, as much as I could, I have compiled in this slide so that you understand that better. Okay, so I hope all of you understood this. Let's go to the next question. A 30-year-old woman with a family history of hearing loss from the mother's side developed hearing problem during pregnancy. So there is a family history of hearing loss and this lady also developed hearing problem during pregnancy. Okay, this hearing loss is bilateral and it is slowly progressive. See, so many clues are there, age group, female, family history, pregnancy, bilateral, progressive hearing loss. Audiometry is showing you that bone conduction, there is hearing loss at 2000 hertz. What is your diagnosis? Okay, I'll give you. Dip at 2000 hertz is called as Carhartt's notch. So what is the diagnosis? Where do you see all of these clinical features? Is it otosclerosis? Is it acoustic neuroma? Is it otitis media with effusion? Or is it sigmoid sinus thrombosis? Yes, I'm waiting for your answers. It's very simple. A lady in the age group of 30 to 40 years with a family history which is probably going to be autosomal dominant with incomplete penetrance, having hearing loss that has increased during pregnancy or after menopause, gradually progressive conductive hearing loss, bone conduction dip at 2000 hertz, showing us a Carhartt's notch. All of this is suggestive to you of otosclerosis. Okay, so this is very specific for otosclerosis. Now, otosclerosis, other than this, you should know one important thing which is called as what is the syndrome associated with otosclerosis? This syndrome is called as Van der Hoof syndrome. What is Van der Hoof syndrome? Otosclerosis, loose sclera and osteogenesis imperfecta. So, otosclerosis, blue sclera and osteogenesis imperfecta. We call this as van der Hoof's syndrome. So, other than this, what you have to remember is van der Hoof syndrome. Now, how do you diagnose otosclerosis? Of course, audiometry will show you Carhartt's notch, but on tympanometry, you get a specific type of a graph. So, on tympanometry, if you get a AS type of a graph, it is hallmark or diagnostic of otosclerosis. Now, treatment begins with hearing aid. You can give them, uh, you know, uh, sodium fluoride if there is an active deposition of focus happening there or you can do surgery which is stepidectomy or stepidotomy with placement of prosthesis. So, these are all the rehabilitative methods or treatment methods for otosclerosis. Mm -hmm. Characteristic feature of otosclerosis are all except conductive deafness, positive Rinne's test, paracusis vilsi, pearly white ear tongue. So let me know your answers in the chat box. I don't want to. Okay, fine. Yes, so the characteristic feature of otosclerosis are all except. So, which is not a feature of otosclerosis? See, basically in otosclerosis, there is excessive bone deposition happening at the foot plate of stapes. 
So when there is excessive bone deposition happening at the foot plate of stapes, the stapes is not mobile resulting in a conductive hearing loss. So this is correct. Now the, the disease is happening at the foot plate of the stapes. So what should happen to tympanic membrane? It should be normal. So it is pearly white. This is true. Now in patients with otosclerosis, they have a phenomenon where they hear better in noisy environment as compared to silent environment. So they hear better in noisy environment as compared to no silent environment. This phenomenon is called as paracusis vinci. But do you get a positive Rinne's test? No. Whenever there is a conductive hearing loss, you get a Rinne's test negative. So, this correct answer is positive Rinne's test is not a feature of otosclerosis. Rest of them are all features of otosclerosis. Okay. Let's go to the next question. Ramu presented with persistent ear discharge and hearing loss. Modified radical mastoidectomy was done to him. Patient comes back with a persistent ear discharge and retroorbital pain. What is your diagnosis? Diffuse serous labyrinthitis, purulent labyrinthitis, petrocytis or latent mastoiditis. See, when in what cases do you do MRM? Is it done for safe diseases or is this done for unsafe diseases? Now, if you know the answer when, when we do MRM, then you will get the answer very correctly. See, whenever you do MRM, modified radical mastoidectomy, we do it for unsafe diseases like unsafe or aticoantral type of CSOM or you do it for cholesteatoma, right? So, one of these two conditions only you will do this. Now, if in case you have left back the disease and the patient presents to you with a persistent ear discharge and there is retroorbital pain, and there is a lateral rectus palsy. So, fifth nerve involvement, sixth nerve involvement and there is persistent ear discharge. You should think about inflammation of the apex of the petrous bone. So, inflammation of the apex of the petrous bone result in all of these conditions where there is a fifth and sixth nerve involvement and there is a persistent ear discharge. So, this triad, very good Rohit, is called as Gredinigo's triad and this Gredinigo's triad is a feature of petro Petrocytis. Okay, so this is a feature of petrocytis. In labyrinthitis, they will present to you with vertigo, they will present to you with hearing loss, they can present to you with ear discharge, but they will not present to you with a nerve palsy of fifth nerve and sixth nerve. Mastoiditis can present to you with pain behind the ear, pinna being pushed forward, persistent ear discharge, reservoir sign positive, lighthouse sign, pulsatile otoria, all of that. But there is no cranial nerve involvement. So when there is fifth and sixth cranial nerve involvement, you must think about petrocytis. Okay, let's go to the next question. Phelps sign is seen in glomus jugular, vestibular schwannoma, menias disease, neurofibromatosis. Yes, I am waiting for your answers. Where do you get this Phelps sign? So, Phelps sign is nothing but erosion of the bone between the carotid and the jugular. So, whenever you see there is erosion of the bone between the carotid and the jugular, you must think about a tumor arising from the jugular, which is nothing but your glomus jugular. So, in glomus jugular, on a CT scan, you will see that there is erosion of the bone between the carotid and jugular. This sign is called as Phelps sign. In vestibular schwannoma, you get a sign. That sign on MRI with contrast, we call that sign as an ice cream cone appearance. So, in vestibular schwannoma, what do you see? Ice cream cone appearance. In Menia's disease, there is no specific radiological sign and neurofibromatosis type 2 can cause bilateral acoustic neuroma. So, this is one point that you should remember about neurofibromatosis type 2.
Okay, so it's fine now. I think in between it got cut for a second, but I think it's fine now. Okay, a patient presents with bleeding from the ear, pain, tinnitus and progressive deafness. On examination, there is red swelling behind an intact tympanic membrane which blanches with pneumatic speculum. Management includes all except radiotherapy, surgery, interferon or preoperative embolization. So, can you tell me first of all, based upon this history of bleeding, bleeding from the ear, bleeding from the ear, pain, tinnitus and progressive deafness. Based upon this, what is your diagnosis? Along with this, they have given you complementary finding of red mass that is there behind the tympanic membrane, which is blanching on sigillization. This is a sign which we call it as brown sign. So, where do you get this? What is your treat, uh, diagnosis? Very good, Rohit. This is seen in glomus tumor. So, in treatment of glomus tumor, what is the treatment? The treatment of glomus tumor is embolization followed by surgical excision. So, embolization followed by surgical excision. So, surgery is what you will do. Embolization is what you will do. If it is an inoperable tumor, you will give radiation. So, treatment is uh, embolization followed by surgical excision. Radiotherapy is given for inoperable lesions. But interferon therapy has got no role in the patients of glomus tumor. So, the except answer is going to be interferons. Okay. So, Onodi cell and Haller cell are seen in relation to optic nerve and flora of orbit, optic nerve and the frontal sinus, optic nerve and the ethmoidal air cell, optic chiasma and the nasolacrimal duct. Yes, so tell me what's the answer? Where do you see Onodi cell and Haller cell? They are seen in relation to what structure? The Onodi cell is basically a posterior ethmoidal cell. So, when we take the ethmoidal air cells, they are sandwiched between the frontal sinus anteriorly and the sphenoid sinus posteriorly. So, normally the posterior ethmoidal cells should stop at the anterior wall of sphenoid. But if it extends into the sphenoid sinus, if the posterior ethmoidal cell extends into the sphenoid sinus, we call that cell as an onodi cell. And this onodi cell is seen in relation to that of the optic nerve. Okay, so optic nerve can be present inside it, internal carotid artery can be present inside it. So, this Onodi cell is in relation to optic nerve. Now, what is a Haller cell? Haller cell is an air cell that is present inferior to the orbit and medial to the orbit. So, inferior and medial to the orbit, you will see a air cell. This cell is called as Haller cell. So, you will see Onodi cell and Haller cell in relation to optic nerve and floor of the orbit. So, Haller cell is in relation to floor of the orbit. Onodi cell is in relation to that of optic nerve. Okay. So, I think this was an easy simple question. Now, the next question. Caldwell's view is done for sphenoid sinus, maxillary sinus, ethmoid sinus or the frontal sinus. So, Caldwell's view is done for what? Yes, I am waiting for your answers. When do you do a Caldwell's view? So, whenever we take x-rays for PNS, there are many views. The common questions that come is what is water's view used for? What is Caldwell's view used for? What is PRA's view used for? What is lateral view used for? All these are the questions. So, water's view is occipitomental view. So, the radiation is given from the occiput, goes from the mentum. So, this view is called as occipitomental view. This occipitomental view gives the best view or visualization of maxillary sinus. So, water's view is the best view for your maxillary sinus. So, the reverse W, you get the answer just in case you happen to forget. You know that the answer water's view is for the maxillary sinus. Caldwell's view is occipitofrontal. So, this radiation is given from the occiput, goes through the frontal. So, this view is called as 
occipito frontal view and this occipito frontal view is best used for which sinus it is used to visualize the frontal sinus so a water's view is for maxillary sinus caldwell's view is for frontal sinus then you have got PRA's view. PRA's view is nothing but water's view plus mouth open. This is used for sphenoid sinus. Lateral view can give you visualization of frontal ethmoid and sphenoid, but it gives us mainly the understanding of pattern of pneumatization of the sphenoid. Is it a conchal sphenoid, precellar, cellar, postcellar? So the pattern of pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus is understood by Caldwell's view. So, Caldwell's view is done for the frontal sinus. Okay. So, I hope all of you understood the different x-rays that we use in ENT, especially for nose and sinuses. A child with bad tree has a foreign body in their nose. Which of the following is an important concern? Refer to the specialist and plan for elective removal, local release of chemical from battery and destruction of tissue, rhinolith formation, septal abscess formation. So when there is a foreign body which is a battery, what is of utmost concern for you? What are you going to think about? It contains an alkaline material which will cause alkaline necrosis of the tissue. So, it has to be removed very quickly because it is going to cause tissue necrosis. So, can we do elective removal? No, we have to do an emergency removal. Local release and destructive destruction of tissue, yes, very important. This is this is something that you should keep in mind. That is why it's removed in emergency. Rhinolith is nothing but a small plug of mucus around which there is deposition of calcium, phosphate, and manganese crystals, resulting in a stone-like formation. And septal abscess, if there is pus on the either side of the septum, we call it as a septal abscess. So the most important is local release of the chemical from the battery and that will cause destruction of the tissue okay source of epistaxis after ligation of external carotid artery is maxillary artery greater palatine superior labial or ethmoidal artery so you have ligated the external carotid artery so none of its branches can bleed so when you have ligated the external carotid none of its branches can bleed. So, when none of its branches can bleed, then what is the answer? The artery which is not a part of the ECA circulation will cause bleeding. So, which artery is not a part of the ECA circulation? Maxillary, greater palatine, superior labial or ethmoid? Very good, Rohit. It is ethmoidal artery because ethmoidal is a part of the ICA circulation. So, when we talk about ECA circulation, ECA will give rise to two arteries, facial artery and internal maxillary artery. Internal maxillary artery will in turn give rise to two arteries, sphenopalatine artery and greater palatine artery. The facial artery will give rise to a branch which is called as superior labial artery. So, when you have ligated this, can the end branches bleed? No. What does ICA give rise to? ICA will give rise to ophthalmic artery. Ophthalmic artery will divide into two branches, anterior ethmoidal and posterior ethmoidal artery. So, can the branches from ICA bleed even if you have ligated the ECA? Yes, they can still bleed. So, the answer is ethmoidal artery. Okay, the nerve that gets damaged in zygomatic fracture is supraorbital nerve, infraorbital nerve, facial nerve or lingual nerve. So, if we take this as the orbit and this as the zygomatic bone, whenever there is a zygomatic fracture, there are three fracture lines. That is why it is also called as tripod fracture. So, there is a fracture at the zygomatico-maxillary suture, zygomatico-frontal suture, zygomatico-temporal suture. That is why we call it as tripod fracture. So, when it is, there is a fracture here, it can involve a nerve that is coming from the floor of the orbit, which is nothing but your infraorbital nerve. So, the nerve damage that happens during a zygomatic fracture is your infraorbital nerve. Zygomatic fracture or tripod fracture is the second most common fracture of the facial skeleton. 
the first most common is your nasal fracture the second most common fracture of your facial skeleton is your zygomatic fractures okay what is the most appropriate investigation of for angiofibroma is it angiography is it cct is it mri or is it a plain x-ray now all these investigations are done in angiofibroma but what is the most appropriate investigation for angiofibroma very good most of you have answered it absolutely right the most appropriate or the investigation of choice is a contrast enhanced ct scan we have already discussed the signs on angiography of course you know you will identify the feeding vessel which is internal maxillary artery mri is done to identify intracranial extension and plain x-ray in today's time has got no major role okay functions of video stroboscopy include all except examine the vocal fold mucosa for general health vocal fold anatomical defects differentiate vocal cord uh, cyst from nodule vocal fold biochemical disturbances so what are the functions of video stroboscopy except so which is not a function the video stroboscopy is an investigation where you put alternate lights of bright light and dark light on the vocal cords and you see the vibratory pattern of the vocal cords so it will tell you the mucosal movement on the vocal cords so can it tell us whether the mucosal movement is normal or abnormal yes can it identify anatomical defects like is there a sulcus is there a cleft is there a cyst yes if the red if there is reduced vocal cord mobility and the vocal cord mobility is normal can it help us differentiate cyst from a nodule yes but biochemically is there a myeloidosis or is there any deposition is there any abnormal biochemical disturbance happening in the vocal cord can we identify no so the function of video stroboscopy are all the three except understanding the biochemical disturbances okay in dysphonia plica ventricularis sound is produced from false cords true cords ventricle of the larynx tongue. so dysphonia plica ventricularis sound is produced from where yes i am waiting for your answers Yes, so whenever we use the term dysphonia plica ventricularis, voice is produced from the false cord. So whenever there is a true cord abnormality, either because of psychological issues or non-psychological issues or abnormality of the vocal cord organically, the false cords have to compensate to produce voice. And the true cords are not compensating and hence the, when a sound is coming from the false cords, we call it as dysphonia plica ventricularis. Now, gold standard procedure for prevention of chronic and intractable aspiration. This patient is having chronic and intractable aspiration. What is the gold standard surgical procedure? Thyroplasty, tracheostomy, tracheal diversion and permanent tracheostomy, feeding gastrostomy or jejunostomy. So, what is the gold standard procedure to prevent aspiration? you have to do a permanent procedure over here because the aspiration is chronic and it is happen it is an intractable aspiration you have to do something that is going to not cause aspiration at all which is a foolproof procedure <clears throat> so the uh, surgery that you do for this chronic intractable aspiration is tracheal diversion and permanent tracheostomy so at the first tracheal ring, you will cut the trachea and anastomose it with the upper esophagus. The lower trachea, you bring it outside as a permanent tracheostome. Okay. So behind the larynx, what do you have? You have hypopharynx which continues as esophagus. So you are diverting the first tracheal ring to the esophagus so that even if there is any aspiration, ultimately it will go to the esophagus and not into the trachea. So this procedure where you do the tracheal resection and anastomosis with the esophagus, we call it as tracheal diversion and 
permanent tracheostomy. If you just do tracheostomy from the sides of the tube, there is still a possibility that the aspiration can occur. Thyroplasty, you can't put the vocal cords in midline because patient cannot breathe, right? So if you can put only one cord, so there is still a risk of aspiration. Feeding gastrostomy, of course, the food will go through this gastrostomy tube or the jejunostomy tube, but saliva can still get aspirated. So that is why the foolproof procedure is tracheal diversion and permanent tracheostomy. Okay, Kashima's operation is done for vocal cord, cholesteatoma, sinusitis, atrophic rhinitis. Yes, I am waiting for your answers in the chat box. Where do you do Kashima's operation? See, when the vocal cords are in midline position, whenever there is a bilateral RLN palsy, the vocal cords will come in midline position, they will have strider. So, emergency, you will do a tracheostomy. But after that, you have to create a space for patient to breathe, right? So, you remove the posterior two-thirds of the cord and one arytenoid. So, removal of the posterior two-thirds of the cord and one arytenoid, we call this procedure as Kashima's procedure. So, what is Kashima's procedure? Removal of posterior two-thirds of the cord and one arytenoid. This procedure is called as Kashima's procedure. And it's done for vocal cord in which condition? Whenever there is a bilateral RLM. Okay? Yes. After laryngectomy, dynamic esophageal voice is produced from nose, pharyngoesophageal segment, trachea or the buccal mucosa. Yes, I am waiting for the answers. After laryngectomy, if you want to produce a dynamic esophageal voice, you produce from where? From the nose or the pharyngoesophageal segment or the trachea or the buccal mucosa. Yes, this is a very easy question. If you want to produce, of course, there is no larynx. So, you have to use the pharyngoesophageal segment to produce voice. So, whenever the patient wants to produce voice in a tracheoesophageal prosthesis, he will temporarily block the opening of the tracheostoma with the finger. The air current from the trachea, the air current from the trachea will be redirected now because the stoma is closed, it will be redirected through the valve into the esophagus. Now, at the level of upper esophageal sphincter or the pharyngoesophageal sphincter, there is vibrations which will generate acoustic waves. And when these acoustic waves come out of the articulators, it will produce speech. Okay, so speech is produced whenever there is a vibration of the pharyngoesophageal segment. So this has to be having a tone and it has to be patent and competent. Only then the patient will have a good voice. A tracheostomy station patient with a portix tracheostomy tube in the ward developed sudden complete blockage of the tube. Which of the following is the best next step in the management? Immediate removal of the tracheostomy tube, suction of the tube with sodium bicarbonate, suction of the tube with saline, transtracheal jet ventilation. So a tracheostomized patient, he has a portex tube. Now he's developed a sudden complete blockage of the tube. What is the next step in the management? See, when there is a complete blockage of the tube, the patient is on a tube because of the very purpose that he is not able to breathe from the upper airway, right? So, you have done a tracheostomy. Now, if it is blocked, you have to, of course, open that block and remove the tube without which it is going to be difficult. So, you have to open that tube only then the patient will be able to breathe. So, the next best step in the management of this patient is immediately you have to remove the tracheostomy tube to enable the patient to have at least some airway from breathing. Usually, if there is a double lumen tube, you will remove the inner tube and the outer tube will still be there. But if there is a single lumen tube, you will have to remove the tube. And if possible, replace with another tube or put an endotracheal tube or a mini tracheostomy tube or a smaller size tube. But first, remove the blockade. Okay? The center for stepidial reflex is superior library complex, medial geniculate body, superior colliculus or lateral lemniscus. So, what is the center for stepidial reflex?
yes i am waiting for the answer so whenever you give a loud sound to one ear the sound goes from the external ear through the middle ear from the middle ear to the inner ear from the inner ear it is transported via the eighth nerve from the eighth nerve it will go to cochlear nucleus from cochlear nucleus it will go to superior olivary complex now at the level of superior olivary complex there is lateral decussation of the fibers to facial nerve nucleus and from there via the branch of the facial nerve the nerve to stapedius there is contraction of the stapedius muscle in the middle ear and this does not happen just on the ipsilateral side there is bilateral contraction of the stapedius muscle so on the ipsilateral side and also on the contralateral side there is contraction of the stapedius muscle so this response that you see contraction of the stapedius muscle we call this as stapedial reflex and where is this decussation happening at the level of superior olivary complex okay so the center for stapedial reflex is superior olivary complex okay a positive fistula test during segalization indicates ossicular discontinuity erosion of the lateral semicircular canal csf leak through the ear fixation of the stapes bone what does the positive fistula test mean see whenever we say the word fistula what does that mean fistula essentially means a communication between middle ear and inner ear so whenever there is a communication between the middle ear and an inner ear we say that there is a fistula sign positive so what does that mean in the middle ear we have got two prominent projections of the inner ear the first one is by the basal turn of the cochlea the second one is by the lateral semicircular canal so whenever there is an erosion of the lateral semicircular canal and when you increase the pressure in the external auditory canal the pressure gets transmitted to the middle ear and from the middle ear the pressure can go to the inner ear to the lateral semicircular canal predisposing to vertigo and nystagmus so whenever there is a positive fistula test during sphigalization you must think there is some communication between the middle ear and inner ear and most often this happens due to cholesteatoma which is known to erode most commonly the lateral semicircular canal okay let's go to the next question trismus in a parapharyngeal abscess is due to medial pterygoid masseter temporalis none of the above so whenever there is a parapharyngeal abscess and there is trismus what is trismus difficulty in opening the mouth or inability to open the mouth we call it as trismus so whenever there is a difficulty in opening the mouth in a parapharyngeal abscess most commonly it is due to very good it is due to involvement of the medial pterygoid muscle so the medial pterygoid undergoes inflammation it will cause spasm and when there is spasm mouth opening becomes restricted so trismus and parapharyngeal abscess is due to involvement of the medial pterygoid okay trauma to posterior pillar during tonsillectomy causes trismus bleeding infection or nasal regurgitation so tonsil basically lies in a fossa which is called as the tonsillar fossa so tonsillar fossa is bounded by anterior pillar and posterior pillar anterior pillar is formed by your palatoglossus muscle posterior pillar is formed by your palatopharyngeus muscle between them there is a lymphoid tissue which we call it as the tonsil so this palatopharyngeus muscle also forms a ridge this is called as passivant's ridge this passivant's ridge prevents the regurgitation so whenever you are swallowing the food will go down and it will not go up because of the contraction of the fibers of the passivant's ridge and this fibers of the passivant's ridge are formed by which muscle the palatopharyngeus muscle so if there is a trauma can this contract well no and as a result can there be nasal regurgitation 
Yes. So trauma to posterior pillar, of course, bleeding is something that you will expect. But what is the specific outcome of trauma to posterior pillar? The answer will be nasal regurgitation. Okay. Which of the following is not a complication of acute tonsillitis? Basal sepsis, acute rheumatism, acute nephritis, acute inflammation or infection of the middle ear cleft. So, which of the following is not a complication of acute tonsillitis? The tonsillitis is most commonly caused by group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. So, if it is caused by group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, it will cause long term complication because of cross reactive antigen against the myocardium, against the glomerulus, against the joint. So, it can cause rheumatic fever, nephritis. Now, re retrograde there can be infection to the eustachian tube causing middle ear infection. But can it cause basal sepsis? No. So, which is not a complication is your basal sepsis. Basal sepsis is a complication that you see following mastoiditis. So, whenever there is a mastoiditis, the pus can trickle from the mastoid and go into the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So, when it goes from the mastoid into the sternocleidomastoid muscle, we call that abscess as a basal sepsis. Okay. The diagnostic test for confirming Menier's disease is history and clinical examination, glycerol test, electrocochleography, high resolution CT scan of the temporal bone. So, what is the diagnostic test for confirming Menier's disease? So, which this test will tell you Menier's disease? Yes, we know you are right. The correct answer is electrocochleography. So, through the tympanic membrane, we insert an electrode and this electrode is placed on the basal turn of the cochlea. And now when the electrode is placed on the basal turn of cochlea, when you give sound impulses, there will be electrical activity happening in the cochlea which is sensed by this electrode. So, this test where we are measuring the cochlear potentials, we call it as electrocochleography. Normally, the SP by AP ratio should be less than 30% or 0.3. But if it is more than 30% or 0.3, we call that patient to have Menier's disease. So, in Menier's disease, the ratio is more than 30%. Okay, let's go to the next question. A very common easy repeat question. The components of trotter's triad are all except. Conductive deafness, ipsilateral temporoparietal neuralgia, palatal paralysis, retroorbital pain. So, all the following are components of trotter's triad except. So, which is not a component of trotter's triad? So, trotter's triad is a component that you see in nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So, in nasopharyngeal carcinoma, you will see there will be three important things. You will see there is unilateral conductive hearing loss because of serous otitis media, also called as non-saturative otitis media. Along with that, there will also be two cranial nerves involvement, a fifth nerve involvement and tenth nerve involvement. Fifth nerve involvement will result in temporoparietal neuralgia and tenth nerve involvement will result in palatal paralysis. Okay, so the component of trotter's triad are all except retroorbital pain. So, you will see conductive hearing loss, you will see temporoparietal neuralgia and you will see palatal paralysis. Okay, so we did this questions. Yeah, the juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is supplied by internal maxillary artery, ascending pharyngeal artery, facial artery or lingual artery. This is a very easy question. I am sure all of you know this. So, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is supplied by which artery? Very good, Rohit. Priya, it's not ascending pharyngeal artery. The correct answer is internal maxillary artery. So, JNA is most commonly supplied by internal maxillary artery. Okay. So, the correct answer is internal maxillary artery. So, with this, we finish the questions for discussion today. I hope you guys enjoyed this session. If there are any specific requests or topics that you would like me to teach you, please let me know in the chat box or the comment section so that I can take up your requests and answer or help you learn things in a better way. 
I will see you all again. Until then, take care and bye bye. Shobhi Khan, I will definitely raise the issue. Whatever you have told, I am not aware of it, but I will definitely raise the issue and I will let you know. Okay? So, take care. Bye bye.